I'm going to give a, a pretty brief overview of advances in genetics and then how we think about moving those advances in genetics into creating targeted therapies. And I'll, I'll put that in the context of this notion of precision health and personalized medicine, which I, you've probably heard of somewhere, maybe on TV or something. So um, I'm going to put uh, all this conflict of interest, although I'm not going to talk about anything that's relevant to this. I always put up the, uh, any, any kind of advisory board that I sit on. So I'm going to talk about, first I'm going to give an introduction. So the main point here is that we are really in the midst of a revolution, a potential, the beginning of a revolution in healthcare. It hasn't come yet, but we're at the very, very onset of that. And it really comes from genetics, but it also comes from big data in general. So I'll introduce genetics of autism and genetics, but also the concept of precision health. I'm going to tell you what genes have been identified in very broad brush strokes and what they mean for clinical practice and treatment. And you've already gotten some of the threads of this through some of the earlier talks, the Harley Shafali talk, talking about genetic testing and clinical applications. I'll go over some of those things again. So the goal of precision medicine, deliver the right treatment every time to the right person. That's a direct quote from Barack Obama. But um, as Niels Bohr, uh, the famous physicist, said, prediction is very difficult, especially if it's about the future, because to deliver the right treatment every time to the right person, you have to have a crystal ball at some level. You have to be able to predict the future, how somebody is going to respond to that medication, whether or not they're going to have an adverse reaction. You're going to have to make some um, guesses about what their trajectory is going to be like and what you have to watch for. And so this is really challenging. So there's an enormous amount of promise, don't get me wrong, and a lot of hope, and a lot of power, but it's not necessarily easy. And there's one thing that's kind of a paradox about this, is that to understand the individual, to understand each of us, we also have to understand everybody else. Because to put myself in the context, if I just am studying myself, I don't know what that means. Am I, is my blood sugar high? How do I know? Well, we know because we've measured tons and tons and tons of people. We know if I'm obese because, um, you know, we've measured a lot of people and we can see where somebody fits. So your doctor can tell you, you have a potential health risk because this value is, is a lot higher than we, we'd like it to be. So, again, I hope that is clear in that by... It kind of, in a way, to get to this level where we give individualized, personalized medicine, or um, most doctors, most of us, and psychologists think that, and, and, and do practice personalized medicine, and that it is a personal interaction, and we're taking care of, um, of all of our neighbors as, you know, as patients, etc. But the precision part of this, the delivery of what that individual needs, what's best for them, again, really means understanding that individual in the context of the entire population and in terms of many populations. So the notion is healthcare tailored to you. Um, you wouldn't wear just any pair of glasses. Your prescription is tailored to your vision. Of course, the prescription issue is a lot simpler. You know, they're grades and we, you know, they measure and they fit you to it. Um, but it's the same idea. Imagine if you were just given the average glasses. That just wouldn't work. Imagine if, again, this is, uh, if the seat in your car didn't move, if it was tailored to the average person, how, how easy that would be to drive. So, again, it's, it's a, this is what we've been doing, and we've been doing it because it's the best that we can do. We're always trying to do the best, but now we have the capability to use big data and genomics to kind of move in another direction, so we need to do that. So the idea is we're using patients' unique differences in their genes, lifestyles, and environments to predict what medical conditions somebody's susceptible to and what treatments are likely to work best. It really is an approach that emphasizes the ways in which your disease risks are unique and different, just like your other more obvious characteristics. And what's interesting, too, is that a lot of the research that we do is based on averages and comparing groups and means. And what I think if, even if the data was hard to look at, one of the things you probably got out of Morella's talk 
was that the in, there's a quite a bit of individual difference. There's really quite a bit of difference in trajectory. Not all the autistic and controlled children look the same. So there are two major drivers of this revolution, decreasing DNA sequencing costs and increasing computing power. Now, what's shown here in this illegible figure, but it, I think it, this is a log scale for those of you who do remember what logs are, log base 10. And so that means that small changes are, ten, are big, big changes. So what you see here is this is the, uh, um, the um, um, Moore's Law, Gordon Moore's Law, the founder of Intel, where he said in the 60s that every 18 months, the power, essentially, of a, of a size of computing chip was going to double. That's, that's doubling every 18 months right there. That's computing power. This is the drop in cost of genome sequencing. It's at a further exponential to that kind of doubling. So we've gone from having a million dollar genome when the first few were sequenced after the Human Genome Project to now having a thousand dollar genome, essentially. What's kind of ironic about it is that the, while the cost of actually making the genome has gone down so much, we still have huge analytic costs. Most, almost half of our cost is not actually sequencing your genome, it's an storing it, it's because it's so big and analyzing it. But still, it's, it's around $1,000. It's really remarkable. And um, I can predict, because other people who know a lot more about this than I do predict, that the cost in the next 10 years will go into the few hundreds of dollars. And again, some of that's going to depend upon computer storage changes, too. So you can imagine that we're going to a place where if it only costs a few hundred dollars, or even $1,000, if you think of your health care cost, in most developed countries, if there is information to be gleaned from your genome, that's a pretty inexpensive test to have in the background if it has predictive information. So that's one of the main drivers of healthcare, really, is going to be this notion of you'll have on your card, in your back pocket, your doctor will have it on their screen, the kind of your genome. And of course, then there's this whole area of informatics, of computers, and the computers crunch all this data. They are actually the enabling technology that allows us to read the three billion base pairs in, in your genome and make sense of it. So the result is millions of genomes sequenced and the power to analyze them. And again, that's really critical because even if I could do your genome and afford it, it's the millions or hundreds of thousands that I need to be able to interpret you in the context of normal variation. So this has already been implemented in cancer. There, there are companies that do this now to some degree, um, that if you have certain types of tumors, it's almost par for the course now that that tumor will be sequenced. Maybe not the whole genome of the tumor, but a significant portion of it to find a mutation that then guides therapy. And there are targeted treatments now for about 5% of tumors. But, you know, five years ago or 10 years ago, it was zero, essentially, based on genomic information. So what we're talking about, again, is we expect in the next 10 years that, that this number is likely to go up to 40 or 50%. So that targeted treatment will be available for the, you know, if not a majority, close to a majority of cancers that are there. And this can really be transformative. So we're at the beginning of what's going to be an explosion of genetic discovery across populations. Again, as genome sequencing drops, more genomes being sequenced. And when we couple this information with all the information in your electronic health records, this is going to create a more accurate understanding of human disease. So imagine if we had one of our goals is to have all UCLA patients sequenced or some kind of genetic information and then have that health record we de-identify the records so that researchers don't know who you are, of course, to protect your privacy. But then they can operate on that, run artificial intelligence, machine learning kinds of tools to identify risk 
things we couldn't even imagine once we get to those populations. So that's kind of where we're going. And again, the body is a source of big data. We all have these wearables, and some of you may have Fitbits and things like that. Those aren't as accurate as we'd like them for medical science, but things there are actually changing quite rapidly. And in some areas, they're actually very sophisticated medical devices that allow us to move patients out of the hospital, put them in their home, and do a lot of monitoring remotely. Um, and, and again, that, there's, there's a remarkable revolution in that area, not just the genomics, but the remote monitoring, remote sensing, measuring metabolites from small band-aid sized patches that are put on your skin. Things like that are in the works and will be available, and most of us will want to contribute our information on our sleep, our diet, and our running so that our doctor can have that, but the doctor's not going to have to digest it. The computer's going to digest that and explain to the doctor what it actually means. Like, this person isn't sleeping enough, but they have a genetic susceptibility to this, and they're eating too late at night, and that kind of thing. They'll be measuring those things. And so genetics isn't everything, but it's, it's quite helpful. And genetics has transformed the clinical landscape in autism, and I'll tell you why. So in 2008, and actually Harley showed a figure from this review that Brett Abrams and I wrote in 2008, which is now almost 10 years ago, but not quite. There were a handful of genes identified, little understanding of any mechanisms of autism. In other words, how, like in cancer, we know the mechanism is the tumor proliferates too much, it grows too much, and it invades. Those are two basic mechanisms. Now, at the, in a laboratory, they'll go and they'll understand the exact pathways that cause that increased growth. Is it too much cell cycle? Is it going too fast? Is there a loss of something that suppresses its growth, et cetera? But basically in cancer, two things happen, too much growth, invasion. And so that's a mechanism, and we didn't have any, of, any notion of that in autism. The major pharmaceutical companies had also withdrawn in general from psychiatric disorders because they had had so many failures. But in 2016, which is last year, there are more than 200 candidate genes, we can define the cause of autism in about 25% of cases using genetic testing, as Dr. Kornblum mentioned. We have clear mechanistic models. We don't know exactly who they apply to yet and exactly how accurate they are, but we're able to actually make a model of how autism might arise. And now we're in a, a part of the, of the science where we're beginning to test those models, and once once those models are tested and validated, it makes it much easier to develop drugs. So let's get back to the genetics then. I wanted to give you that kind of overview to kind of say where we're going and tell you about my hope for the field. And again, some of this is hopeful and optimistic, and that's who I am. But, um, but I think there's reason to be so, um, despite um, threats from the North Korean peninsula. So twin studies, where you have identical twins and twins that aren't identical, the, the fraternal twins, they're just like siblings, show that if you have monozygotic or identical twins, they're, they have, they're much more likely to both share autism, if one has it, than a fraternal twin, much more likely. And that gives you, and, and it can be calculated, and the heritability is between 70 and 90 percent in twin studies. Family studies, that is, where there aren't twins, the risk to a sibling, if you have one child with autism, ranges from about 10 or 15 percent to about 25 percent of the, um, uh, 25 times the population. So if autism occurs in 1 percent, let's say, of, of, of people now, um, then that means that if you have one child with autism, the next child born, depending on sex and, you know, there are other issues, what, where they are, birth order, et cetera, somewhere between 10 and 30 percent risk. It's a very, very high risk. It's 10 times to 30 times over the general population. That gives you a, a, a real sense that there's a strong genetic risk, both of those twin and family studies. Then, of course, many genetic syndromes are known chromosomal disorders, and Harley showed you that long list that you couldn't read. Um, it would go on for pages. So. We've known for decades that autism has a big genetic load, and now that we're finding genes, that's been proven. 
But of course, any phenotype that is what you know what we see in, in any of us I'll is is a result of the genotype plus the environment. And I'm showing here two teddy bears from my colleague Nelson Frymer's sons. He had two sons a couple years apart. One of these teddy bears was loved, and the, and the other one was just ignored and left in the closet, maybe um, put in a case, and you can tell which one was loved. A little bit of wear and tear. But the point here is that these started with the same DNA. They were identical, um, but they look a little different now. And so in no way are genes, in most cases, fully deterministic, but they tell us a lot about risk. So there often isn't a one-to-one -one correspondence between a particular genotype or mutation or gene that somebody has and what they look like. There can be when there's a huge major effect, but that's rare. Most of the time there's a probability. But the probability can be very large. We can say 10 times more likely with this particular genetic mutation or 100 times more likely, et cetera. Does that make sense? The other point that I want to make about the environment is that the environment is very difficult to measure, very, very expensive, and we don't even know what to measure at some level. We know that the environment is important, but I'm not talking about necessarily toxins. I'm just talking about the environment. That's anything non-genetic. Um, and so the space and the, and, and the, you know, how to even get your arms around it and actually measure it is something quite daunting. In Scandinavian countries, they have these birth cohorts and large-scale studies that are going on, and those relatively small, homogeneous, five or six million size, you know, population countries, under 10 million, you know, none of the countries have over 10 million people, they can actually do, do these kind of studies where they measure from conception all the way to birth and look at outcomes and stuff. And I think we're going to learn a lot from those kinds of studies that are very difficult to do here. But we use the genetics as a tool to, once we begin to understand mechanism, then knowing the genetics, which is, we know that we can find the genes, to understand how the environment might modify or might work with them. And of course, because behavioral and cognitive therapy and other, um, and, and a lot of the therapies you're going to hear about actually work, we know that the brain is environmentally plastic and modifiable, and so therefore the environment does play a, a critical role. So Harley touched on this a little, but I want to go into it in a little more detail. What are the clinical and, and other implications of knowing a genetic cause of the disease? So right now, in most cases, unlike in cancer, I don't have a therapy for most mutations. But it gives us a starting point where we can then understand mechanism, build models, and then develop therapies. So what is its clinical use now? Well. Let's say I tell a patient has Down syndrome. The parents don't have Down syndrome. That's a mutation that's called new or de novo type of mutation. That's a genetic, but it's not inherited from the parent. It looks like about 25% of the causes of autism are major gene mutations. In about 20, 25% of cases are de novo mutations. It's not Down syndrome, but the same mechanism. So it's things that the parents don't have, but that occurred in the germline somehow. Knowing that is really important, because it tells you that the recurrence risk to the next sibling that's coming along isn't at the population level, because de novo events are rare. And so it's telling you it's quite a bit less than that. So it's important for family counseling. It can tell you about recurrence risk. But of course, down the road, we hope that knowing the genetic basis of the disorder has, helps us with prevention. We can understand gene environment interactions, how to intervene properly for the right patient with the certain types of mutations, et cetera. The mechanism of mutation might be preventable. And um, of course, early diagnosis and even using the current interventions we have, um, our, our gut, and, and there's quite a bit of data on this, that, is that the earlier we intervene, uh, the better the outcome. So let me give you a little terminology, and then we'll move on to some results. So we have 23 pairs of chromosomes, right? Um, and you get one from mom, one from dad. That includes the sex chromosomes, where a woman has two X's, or a girl 
and a boy has an X and a Y. So you have two copies of every gene, one from mom and one from dad. So, and this is just showing a particular red boxed area right here from this chromosome five that's been blown up. And each one of these things here is just a schematic, like a blueprint of a gene. And these hatches are the coding parts of the gene. Most genes don't code for the protein that they're actually coding for. Most of the gene is what we call space junk in um, technical terminology. I'm kidding. Um, it, it's, it's stuff that regulates when and where that gene is turned on and how it's formed. But the business end that then makes proteins, you can think of genes as a blueprint and the proteins as the factory that works in your cells to get things done. So this is the blueprint. And, and so in this very, very small region, you can already see there are like a dozen genes. So when we find a chromosomal abnormality, one of the copy number variants using a chromosomal array, it's usually a, a deletion of a bunch of genes of a region, not just one gene, usually a bunch, or a duplication. And we'll get to that in a moment. But it affects many genes. Now here's another word. I want everybody to say it fast. Single nucleotide polymorphism. <laughs> so I told you we have three billion base pairs in our genome. Each one of the, our base pairs is, is a, you can think of like a letter in an alphabet. It's an A, a C, or a T, or a G. So four letters form the entire basis for our genetic code. And at every position, it can be variable or polymorphic. Polymorphic is another word for variability, for variable. So if you have a polymorphism there, it means that you have a difference than most of the other people around you there. So every thousand base pairs, we have a polymorphism. Now, a mutation is a change in a base pair or a piece of DNA that is really rare, that has a major effect, and that's very, very rare. A polymorphism or a single nucleotide polymorphism or a SNP is present in more than 1% of the population. So these polymorphisms are present in, in every polymorphism that any of us has is present in other people in the room here. But a mutation that you have almost certainly isn't. The reason is mutations have large effects and they're weeded out by evolution. So we don't share, co our common ancestor has passed this on, it's got weeded out. The polymorphisms have very small effects. That's why we share them. They're not weeded out by evolution. So we all share the vast majority of our genome with each other. If the SNP variant is more than 1%, it's a polymorphism. If it's rare, it's more likely to be a mutation. A mutation having a specific connotation that it leads to disease or causes dysfunction in that gene, whereas polymorphism is just talking about variability. It doesn't mean that it's causing a disease. Does that make sense? So one of the polymorphisms that's actually quite common are copy number variants. So I lied to you. I told you we each had two copies of every gene. Turns out that 5% of our genome is copy number variant or polymorphic. What does that mean? That means in that part of the chromosome, if we look at each gene now as an alphabet letter, it could be inverted. It could be deleted. You could see there the D, E, and F, and G are deleted, and here they're duplicated. 4% of our genome is like that, and that means that we've either lost the maternal or paternal copy of, of those four genes there, or gained an extra four copies. So in most cases, those polymorphisms are benign. They're not mutations that cause disease. But when they're de novo, like Down syndrome, Down syndrome is a copy number variant that involves an entire chromosome in most cases. Most of these are submicroscopic, though, and we weren't aware of, the, of them until the technology allowed, gave us a microscope, essentially, that was strong enough to enable, with resolution enough, to, ele to enable us to look at this at 4G resolution, which is below the resolution of a light microscope. 
So a light microscope, under a light microscope, when they do karyotyping and they look at your chromosomes, and maybe in, in school you've looked at this or your kids have or you've seen this, you know, the chromosomes painted out, you can see that under a microscope. And you can see a deletion or duplication or an inversion that's 5 million base pairs. So that's still a pretty small piece of 3 billion base pairs, but it's, it's, it's big. So with the copy number variants, we can find things that are 10,000 base pairs. So kind of, you know, a thousand times, you know, essentially about a thousand times smaller than we could before. So it's opened up a whole new um, area. So visible chromosomal anomalies are not common. So doing a karyotype on 100 autistic kids who, who don't have severe seizures and intellectual disability or don't have some dysmorphology, almost zero are you going to see anything with a karyotype. However, using a microarray to look at structural variants gives you this higher resolution. So again, 23 pairs of chromosomes, and I've shown you there in red that that piece is deleted from the mother. You can't see that under a microscope because it's under 3 to 5 million base pairs. Let's just say it's 5 genes. It's about 100,000 base pairs. This is a duplication on 15Q11 to Q13 that actually turns out to be the most common inherited and de novo copy number variant in autism. It occurs in almost 1% of patients. The most common abnormality genetically that, that is seen in boys is fragile X, which is seen in more than 1% of boys with autism. But using this microarray, which was implemented about 10 years ago, we can find these, these copy number variants. Some are normal, as I said. We all have them, and others are pathogenic. And how do we figure out if they're pathogenic? Well, we have to look at a large amount of the population. And if we're seeing it appearing over and over and over again in people who are neurotypical, we can say, statistically, that's not pathogenic. But if, we, if the parents don't have it and it occurs newly or de novo in the offspring and it's big and it's never been seen before or only seen in people with intellectual disability, developmental delay, or autism, then we can say it's autism associated. Does that make sense? That's, again, the, the power of the population. So it turns out these are just three studies. Whoops. Large CNVs, these structural chromosomal abnormalities, are seen. These are a bunch of studies in about 6% of patients with autism in, in academic studies. In a clinical population like ours, we might even see them in 10% because maybe we get slightly more severe cases at UCLA here. You know, it just depends. But it's between 5 and 10%. So that means you get a, a major, large effect size genetic mutation in 5 or 10% of kids that can, you know, kind of, you know, stop any further diagnostic workup, et cetera. It, it's a pretty high yield test. If we, so, on top of this, now we can do genome sequencing. And I'm just going to summarize this. These, now a number of studies have been done, even, even further than this. But we estimate that 500, more than 500 genes contribute to autism, and we can find them using sequencing. We don't do a specific gene test. We just sequence the genome. But even the most frequent muta mutated genes, this is just some of them, each account for less than 1% of cases. And I'm going to show you that in a slide. If we add up over 100 mutations that we already know cause autism, it still accounts only for about 3 to 5% of autism, depending on the population. So we're, every, every few weeks, we're discovering new genes, literally. Another thing that's found is that the older the father, the more the higher the mutation rate. So if you go from, let's say, being 20 to being 50, you have about a threefold increase in de novo mutations causing autism. So there are many forms of genetic variation and many different modes of inheritance. And again, I just put this up here for those who are aficionados. You have it in this, you know, it's on the website. Um, 
It can be recessive, that is, you have to have a copy from mom and dad. It can be dominant, that is, coming from one of the parents, but more often than not, it's dominant, but it's de novo. In other words, you just need one copy, but, it's, but the parents don't have the mutation it occurred in the egg or the sperm. It could be X-linked, like Fragile X. And then a lot of the risks for autism are polymorphisms, are things that we all share, additively adding up, thousands of them adding up and increasing risk. Because just like things like high blood pressure, height, weight, all of, all of the phenotypes that we have, all of the things you can measure in humans, cognition and behavior is normally distributed, and we're all somewhere on the range, and it's small effect size variants that have come through over thousands of years of evolution of humans that have, you know, that now um, really give risk to this. So we have kind of almost two different forms, you could say. You have these large effect size like Fragile X, and then you have the kind of common variation. And even in some cases, we can see a copy number variant in a child, but that child also has the additive common, what we call polygenic or mixed background risk too. So it's very, very complicated. But by understanding, and, and again, I just put this up here just to show you that none of these mutations on the left actually account, they're all like 0.2%. So they're rare. But together they combine to about 25%. So by doing a chromosomal microarray and exome sequencing, we can find 20, 25% now. So it's clinically indicated. So another thing about autism is that it overlaps with intellectual disability. About a third of the kids have intellectual disability. You heard about epilepsy a little bit already. But what sets autism apart is social cognition and alterations and what I'll, what I'll summarize as mental flexibility. It's a little bit more complicated than that. So one of the questions is how do mutations actually cause this specificity? Are they specific and how would they do that? One of the thoughts is that these large effect size mutations, like a Down syndrome, de novo, these you know, fragile X, 15Q duplication, aren't necessarily causing autism. They didn't come, they derailed development. So this notion that development is a normal process, like a train on a track or a boat in a canal, canalization, and that we're buffered, you know, our genetics are pretty buffered and you know, we can take a certain amount, but over a certain amount, if the sledgehammer is too big, you're knocked off the track. And that's essentially what these mutations are doing. So there are many genes, many genetic models, and no major gene accounts for more than 1%. So we have a kind of very heterogeneous condition from an etiologic standpoint. So the challenge is that we now have hundreds of genes identified. They provide targets for mechanistic understanding and therapeutic development. Will we have to develop a specific targeted therapy for each one, each rare disorder, or will they converge, as Mirella was showing, on particular brain connectivity processes, particular signaling pathways or cell types that we can target with medication, et cetera? And so we've done some studies that begin to ask this. So here's development from embryonic, you know, day zero through birth at 36 weeks on the left, all the way through postnatal development. This is years. This is when the brain is developing um, all of its cells, really, at, you know, during um, embryonic development. So where do autism genes, we can actually now look and ask, now that we have hundreds, are they expressed in these areas? Which brain region, what cell type, and when? And it turns out they're highly concentrated prior to birth. Highly, highly concentrated. In fact, during the process of what we call neurogenesis, which is when neurons are born. Now, there are other things that occur slightly later, but almost every gene that's been identified is expressed at very high levels in the fetal brain. So again, this, this points to very early developmental abnormalities that then play out over time and are clearly modifiable. It's not fixed. And these genes fit into categories. Like we can, once we identify them, we can begin to say, aha, uh -huh. Here are a bunch of genes that are involved in activity-dependent protein synthesis. This is when a neuron fires, proteins are made to respond to that, to cause learning. And so here, you know, here are a bunch of genes involved in that. Neuronal activity, channel genes. This is, you know, neurons 
are electrically conductive, and these are genes that modify that. During development, the neurons see each other and they move. Neuronal cell adhesion. So how do we develop therapeutics? Well, one thing is we can now take skin cells from individuals. We can make them into stem cells and make brain cells from them. And so human brain in a dish, many of you may have heard NPR yesterday morning. There, was, there have been some massive advances every month in this area. We're actually working with the researchers at Stanford who have made some of these developments to make kind of autism mutations in the brain developing in a dish so we can understand mechanisms. There are also many valid mouse models. We can take these mutations, use genetic engineering, put them in the patient stem cells. We can also make mice with these mutations. And this is just the name of some of them. Now I'm going to show you one of my videos. This gene, CNTNAP2, turns out to cause the most common neurodevelopmental disability in the Amish. And it's a form of autism with language delay and seizures in the Amish. Yeah. And um, so let me see if I'll get this to work. This is my movie. <laughs> Not as nice as Harley's. And a treatment with oxytocin, a social bonding hormone. The oxytocin has been given to the knockout there on the left, and you can see they're hanging out a lot more together, whereas on the right they're not. And we've seen this pretty remarkably in these mice. So you can begin to test therapies in mouse models with uh, mutations that, these mice aren't autistic, the patients with the mutations are, but this is a model of that. You take the mutation, you put it in the mouse, and then you test various drugs and therapies that come from the mechanistic understanding of, that we're gaining. So I just want to, um, one of my grad students, when she gave her thesis defense about four years ago, put this up, and I'd forgotten I actually said it, so I like it a lot. <laughs> um, but the recent demonstrations in animal models that many developmental disorders that we know start in the embryo can be reversed in adulthood in a number of mouse models, including Fragile X, are a paradigm shift in our concept. Should they generalize to humans, which we don't know, genetically identified pathway therapeutics would become the most important area of future treatment research in autism. I still believe that. And again, I want to give you a quote from a very famous, now, uh, uh, Paul Kal Kalanathian, who is a neurosurgeon at Stanford who died of cancer, but wrote a book, When Breath Becomes Air. And uh, for young people like me, I'm 36, given a diagnosis of cancer, there aren't many words. And then my health began to improve thanks to a pill that targets a specific mutation, targeted to his cancer. I mean, unfortunately, his cancer got around that, you know, cancer escapes sometimes. And so they didn't have a drug for the next escape. But the drug gave him, you know, an extra few years and our idea is, the whole idea here is targeted therapy, targeted to genetic mutations, targeted to the individual patients. So again, we're thinking convergent pathways. We don't think we're going to have to develop an individualized therapy for every single patient, but we can, by looking at the individual patient, identify the best therapy for them. And so while autism is largely genetic, its etiology is very multifactorial, it's very heterogeneous, and we can begin to implement a kind of precision work in autism, thinking of autism as the autisms, using genetics and the other biomarkers that you heard about. Rare genetic variants contribute a lot to autism, and so genetic testing is warranted to identify these cases. It, it, it ends what we call the diagnostic odyssey and actually saves quite a bit of money, as well as just headache and hassle for families. Exome sequencing is a clinical test in autism, and soon whole genome sequencing will be a clinical test. That genetics provides a route to development of new therapies. And one of the ways we do this is we genetically engineer animals, cells, and now that we have human cells in a dish that are beginning to resemble, they're not human brains by any standard. They don't think, um, they don't, you know, um, <laughs> we'll be able to develop innovative treatments. So I have to thank, again, this is the Geshwin lab, a few different views over the years, um, and they're the people who actually do all the work that I talk about. So thanks. <laughs>